Welcome to the fifth annual California Land Trust Conference. We have over 300 participants across the two days, uh, yesterday and today. We're very excited and have uh, heard great things from all of you about the workshops yesterday and very excited about the, both the plenary topics that we have this morning and then 12 breakout sessions that we're going to have this afternoon on a wide range of topics from planned giving to new developments in the bond front to cutting edge news on appraisals and so forth. So there's a lot of excellent instructors and information for you today in addition to having the always very valuable opportunity of networking with your colleagues and friends. So last year, 2008, was a very productive year, very uh, wild, a lot of things happened, and as you know, we were all uh, very, I think, up and down, greatly inspired, but also uh, found some very challenging days. But for CCLT, we had a very productive year, and we think delivered a lot of important services and benefits to the land trust, and I just wanted to share a few examples. A very important priority for the land trust community is the volunteers that we use that make it possible to get trails built, to get pampa grass removed, a wide variety of things. And as you know, this was threatened last year, and it was literally the last bill to get out of the legislature that we were able to do. But it is extended for three years. As counterintuitive as it sounds, that we don't have to pay volunteers, at least for three more years. We also worked very hard on the appraisal issue. Uh, this, when we started uh, the year 2008, it looked like a very damaging bill was going to go through the legislature that would have brought profound changes and potentially uh, changes to the appraisal process in California in, by the state agencies that could have slowed, if not halted, virtually all acquisitions in the state. And we were able not only to turn that bill back, but to bring forward a very positive bill that we think will increase public confidence and transparency in the appraisal process and get the rules of the road very well established and something that will work for land trusts, landowners, and the public agencies as well. So that was another big accomplishment last year. We did a lot of work in the area of communications and tried some new strategies of working with our members and with the media. And thanks to Resource Media, our consultant on this topic, a number of you um, were able to get op-eds placed around the closure of state parks and other important statewide issues, but to really bring it home in your local communities for those local papers and, of course, the community leaders and decision makers in your community. So this is something that worked very well. We were very happy to work and thrilled with our experiences of working with the land trust, and it, it was very positive uh, partnership and something we're going to be continuing in the coming year. And we just released a report. It's in the other room. This is a result of about a year of work and something that the Southern California Land Trust identified uh, more than a year ago as the need to make a, a, a case statement, essentially, about the need for land protection in Southern California, that it's not all paved over. And so this report, with the contribution of all the Southern California Land Trust members, is just a terrific example of the many and diverse public benefits that land and water conservation bring to local communities. And so I encourage you to take a look at that report and the posters that are in the display room. It's a very exciting opportunity, I think, that we have to take the conservation and the land trust story to the public. And this is part of what we hope will become a series called Saving the California Dream. And we would be doing similar ones for other parts of the state or for particular types of resources like farm and ranch land. In the coming year, we plan to continue to be, bring a very solutions-oriented approach to our work. In the area of funding, something of great priority these days, uh, we want to make sure that we keep you updated about the budget situation, about funding, what we're hearing from private foundations, and of course the bond freezes that continues to unfold. And in light of that, as uh, you'll hear more about, the, uh, the potential purchase possibly of bonds to get some of the bond projects moving again. So we're really working in a very concrete way to address the pressing priorities that the land trusts are facing. We want to continue working to raise awareness 
about land trust and the conservation through the media work that I just described, but also the work that you do and the benefits of conservation with funders, community leaders, and others. And our partnerships with all of you are essential to make that happen. And finally, we do a lot of work to partner in partnership with our regional councils to provide training and other educational opportunities. And this year, we're pleased to unveil two new courses. The first is a six-hour accreditation course that was offered yesterday for the first time and is going to be offered throughout the state, as well as some extended assistance to small groups as they start going through the accreditation process. And then finally, plan giving, which is going to an overview course, is going to be offered this afternoon for the first time, and an in-depth webinar series later. So these, again, are, I think, opportunities that we have to build our organization stronger while uh, during this time when some other uh, work may be forestalled temporarily. Like never before, CCLT continues to deliver values, the critical information, and solutions to the challenges that you face. I just mentioned a minute ago this possible purchase of bonds to start projects going, and that will help all projects, we think, eventually get moving, unfrozen and moving faster. And we'd like to thank you for your steady support, your support in the past, and in helping CCLT get established. And we know this is an especially challenging time for your budgets, for your organizations, for your land saving, for your stewardship projects. And so it can be challenging to figure out where those scarce dollars can go. But we hope you'll remember the work and services that CCLT provides to your land trust and continue your support so that we can continue working for you. This is clearly a time for us all to dig deeper. Like the advice that, and what we, that you give to uh, your staff, what we have learned from previous recessions, is that people decide during these financially challenging times what isn't most important to them. And that is what they choose to invest in and sometimes refocus and reorient their giving, their lives, their volunteering. And so for the land trust community, I think we should view this as a similar, in a similar way that our, we know our donors do, that this is a time to look to what, to our fundamentals, and especially what is most important for our long-term fundamentals. And to this end, I'd like to suggest three things that really go to our long-term sustainability of which this economic time is just, in the end, a short, hopefully we, ho we, we hope a very short blip on the screen. So first, unlike many other types of nonprofits who do very important work, for land conservation, we're in it for perpetuity. We have to take care and have made a commitment to taking care of the lands and easements that we've protected in perpetuity. Over time, there may be some mergers and so forth of land trust, but in general, our organizations must be here to stay. For that reason, plan giving is essential to our future. How else are we going to build up those long-term assets to care for these lands long after we may be out of the direct protection, the new protection of lands? And this is especially true given some of the research that shows younger generations are not as interested in conservation in the environment as their parents were. So we need to tackle that challenge, but also recognize the unprecedented opportunity that the intergenerational transfer of wealth is about to have in this country. And even with the decline of the stock market, the transfer of wealth in the next 20 years is huge and incredible. And I want a lot of that money to go to the land trust community. If your organization does not have a planned giving program, this is a huge opportunity that your land trust cannot miss to ensure that you're going to be around in the long run to uh, take care of these lands and waters that you've protected. Second, I encourage you to think about the conservation relevance of your organization. It is really important. We have done a terrific job of protecting land and stewarding it and are continuing to improve in stewardship and restoration all the time. But I think it's important that we think about how can we really spread our roots in the community? How can we really make conservation and the land trust, your organization, 
relevant to the daily lives of your community members, and including and perhaps especially the children who are going to be your future supporters, future supervisors, and other decision makers that's going to influence what can happen with your lands. So this can look quite different. It does look quite different um, in different places. Land Paths, an organization in Sonoma County, began a community garden uh, with a small piece of property that they had acquired that has just blossomed, uh, even surprising um, the land trust itself into the huge community response to that community garden and how the parents and children have just taken ownership of it and love and live it and has brought the land trust into the lives of a whole new group of folks. Amigos de los Rios has involved the children and the kids are bringing their parents to not only design parks and then build them, but to become the long-term stewards of these parks. American River Conservancy is working to protect the first home site of a Japanese community here in California. And this has brought just tremendous awareness of the land trust and support for them in the Asian community, which is a large community in many areas of California, including where the American River Conservancy works. And finally, the Big Sur Land Trust, after the firestorms this past year, contributed $100,000 to the farm worker housing that had been damaged by the uh, firestorms. Just tremendous um, outreach, goodwill that that has generated and really making the land trust seem that part of the community in a way that buying land and perhaps locking it up, quote, unquote, um, does not do. This does not have to be mission drift. You can work with others and bring your unique mission and skills of protecting land and stewarding it and partnering with other community groups as well. For example, the Feather River Land Trust has made it a priority to try to protect lands near schools within walking distance of schools so that that land is then available for the schools to develop environmental education programs. So making conservation relevant and embraced by your local community making it something that becomes part of their daily lives, I think will help us all ensure that there is support for our organizations, more importantly, for the lands that we've protected, and perhaps most importantly, that there is a constituency out there to help us defend these lands as time goes on and we have challenges. We need folks that are gonna be ready to show up at Board of Supervisor meetings, contribute to legal defense costs, and so forth. Third, I'd like you to think about how we could do a better job of sustaining our people, the staff, the boards, and their families. And I'm, this especially applies to um, our leaders within the land trust communities. Far too many that I see are exhausted, they work in isolation, way too many hours. In the last year, we've lost three very strong, experienced executive directors in California. We've seen similar things the last few years, and I think this is a trend that we need to be concerned about and how we really keep all of our staff, and especially our leaders, not stretched so thin, not working such long hours, because in the long run, it isn't a good service to our organizations. Further, we need to worry about the next generation. Who is coming after us and start cultivating and recruiting these folks? And in light of what I just talked about, some of the isolation and exhaustion, the long hours and so forth, we identified what we thought was a really promising staff member at an organization to start recruiting him and helping him think about perhaps becoming a future executive director. We thought he was just a great candidate. And he was very receptive initially, and after he thought about it for a while and looked at the existing situation with the executive director at that land trust, he decided this is not a lifestyle he wants. So I think we need to think about not only where's our next generation of leaders coming, but how do we create a more supportive environment for that next generation so that we can continue the tremendous work that uh, we have accomplished in the last several decades. This has been a very different address than I figured six months ago I'd be giving. 
Six months ago, I was very focused on the fact that we had depressed land prices, and I thought this is a great opportunity for land trust. We can stretch that public dollar, that charitable dollar, much further. And I was talking with funders about how can we get some charitable dollars expedited to take advantage of this great opportunity for the next couple years. Now I'm talking to them about could they you know, help us with the bond freeze situation and, and getting some of our projects going. I was also thinking a lot about and filled with a lot of optimism about political opportunities, especially at the national level and some of the changes we were going to see there in climate change and conservation and um, other opportunities. And instead, we're, we've you know, just been witnessing the meltdown, essentially, of the California government and their ability to work to solve the problems of Californians. But nevertheless, I still feel optimistic that in the end, you know, public funding is going to be going, but the support for conservation is strong now, and I think people will continue to turn to what is most important to them, and um, all of you are a very creative, dynamic, innovative group, so I think we will dig deeper. Hopefully this is going to be an opportunity to invest in some long-term fundamentals like plan giving and others, but I think we will not only survive but thrive during this time. Thank you.